Welcome to a very special edition of the Wormhole. It's not a regular Wormhole episode as we have seen in the past. This time, the Wormhole has turned right around on itself and my guest is actually right here in Trinidad and Tobago with me. Why is this a special edition? Because this episode is to mark a very special time for women and girls in science. So February 11th, is uh, declared the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And March 8th has been declared as the International Women's Day by the United Nations. Therefore, between February 11th and 8th of March, the International Astronomical Union actually celebrates women and girls in astronomy. So this special episode is actually dedicated to all the three events that we are looking at from February 11th all the way to March 8th. So I have a very special guest lined up for us today. And uh, um, let me go right ahead and introduce her and welcome her to the show. Hello, Ariel. How are you? Hello, hello. Wonderful to be here. <laughs> Excited. Great having you on the show with us. So who is Ariel Chaitan? Ariel Chaitan recently completed her MPhil degree in the field of astrophysics at the University of the West Indies after having graduated with a first class honors with a double major in mathematics and physics from the University of the West Indies as well. She was the class valedictorian for her graduating class in 2018. She has had the honor of being a NASA intern in 2018, a highly competitive program for selection. At NASA, she worked on the aeronautics of the flow in a wind tunnel. Her graduate research focuses on the dynamics of triple black holes. She currently also works in the physics department at the University of the West Indies, demonstrating experiments to undergraduate students. And folks, it is my absolute and great pleasure to introduce you to my own student, Ariel Chaitan. <laughs> so once again, Ariel, welcome, welcome. And I'm so happy you could join us to recognize and to observe women and girls in science, which kicks off on February 11th. So I'm going to start by asking you right away, did you always want to do astronomy? I mean, as a little girl growing up in Trinidad? Um, so I think it's, it's kind of a similar story to you as, uh, as a young little girl in Trinidad, I always was very fascinated with the sky and, and with, with what's going on up there. I had like this big, this big book I used to study astronomy. And I remember thinking, and especially during high school, I was, I was very involved in the astronomy club in SAGS. And I, I always knew that I, I, I really wanted to do something with astronomy and with physics. But like you and like so many other people as well in Trinidad, I was like, you know, the Caribbean, really, we don't really have much, much prospects for astronomy, right? That's not something that we do a lot of. So I was very, you know, concerned about it. So I remember I, after high school, I applied for a degree in actuarial science. Um, and I was like, okay, that's a, that's a safe job. That's something I can get money with. It has mathematics. So I signed up for that, but I don't think I even made it to a single class because I had to stop myself. I, I was like, you know what, this, this is not going to make you happy at all. You know what you want to do? And that is, you love physics, you love astronomy. So do that, follow that. So I ended up taking a whole year off. And the next year I applied for a degree in physics and mathematics. And as soon as I stepped into those classes, I was like, yes, okay, I made the right decision. This is what I want to do. So it, it, it got there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you could feel that this is where you belong. And I must say, uh, I'm quite happy for the loss of actuarial sciences is a gain for us in astronomy in the Caribbean. And one of the things that I'm sure you're aware of also is that while in astronomy and in sciences, there's this big push also for STEM to get more people into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, women tend to be in smaller percentages. And across different disciplines, even that varies. And particularly in astronomy, the number of women and girls in astronomy remain much, much smaller, given that we represent half the population. So I'm very happy, Ariel, that you decided to ditch actuarial sciences <laughs> and join us in the Department of Physics. And oh, it's all science. <laughs> 
So it's always been wonderful. So you sort of already mentioned it and then you got into um, your physics program and eventually graduate work in astronomy. Did you second guess yourself at, um, in your journey along the way that is this really going to work out? Uh, well, yeah, of course. Like like I said in the, in the beginning, definitely, definitely. And then even as an undergraduate student, when I was doing physics and 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 starting to do astronomy, um, I would always be like, "Well, is this is this right? Would I have a career? Is is it safe? Blah blah blah." And I know it, it was always like an iffy thing because it's such a, a competitive field for one and two. There's a there's not very many opportunities here for astronomy. But I I, I get. I just told myself, you know, this is. This is something that you love and this is something that you know you want to to spend the rest of your life doing and yes it's a risk but every time i hear those questions in my head i just remind myself of, of how much i love it and and that is well like I, I want to do that and i just have to go for it <laughs> excellent so the love overpowers any uncertainties that you may have all right so as we have mentioned already um the international astronomical union um uses this month to um encourage and have activities for women and girls in astronomy as well so clearly there's an issue and i have mentioned that in terms of percentages the percentages are significantly smaller they're getting better but they have been as low as 20 percent of um, professional astronomers in some cases it varies in different countries and so on so have you found that you had any experiences that you felt some type of gender bias in studying astronomy or were you affected just because you're a girl? Um, so I would start off answering a question by saying that definitely now compared to how it was just like 10, 20 years ago is, is a lot better. I know like um, for all the women before me, for you as well, you would have experienced like institutionalized kind of discrimination based on gender for me um thankfully nothing institutional yet <laughs> I hope not but um I do remember in high school like you mentioned I was doing like applied math and stuff like that and I remember the classes being predominantly male students and there would be like just a few female students um in those classes and um I think most of of those types of discrimination that I I feel is is like the one in, in, in many kind of interactions that you have with people. I remember when I was in year one of, of my undergraduate degree, a very unfortunate incident happened. Um, I was very, like I said, very bright eyed. I really loved astronomy and cosmology and all that stuff. And I had, I think, a, a tutor or demonstrator who was talking to me and he, he was like, um, so what do you want to study later on? And I, and I to told him, I want to do cosmology. And I still remember the look on his face and, and the way he watched me. And he was like, no, I think I think you're better off studying something like cosmetology. And I was so I at, at, at that time, being so young and, and so wide eyed about it, that really hurt me in, in the moment. But um, but right after and even now, I always remember it. And I remember also the anger I felt at it. And I kind of used that as fuel to, to, to push me to, to continue doing it and and I definitely think, you know, cosmetology, cosmology, why not both? Why not do everything? You know, I think definitely women are, are capable of doing anything and everything. <laughs> so it's very, very. That's quite a story because these are the things sometimes people don't realize. The subliminal things, yeah. small things someone says incidentally uh, has effect on our mindset and um that one hurts, <laughs> that rather cosmetology over cosmology. I agree with you. We can do it all, but it doesn't mean that we can do cosmology as well. It, the thing is, too, like, they don't, I, I don't know if he was trying to be funny, if it was a joke, but those things kind of end up affecting people, as you say, yeah. Yeah, and these are the things that we now have to become very aware of in encouraging young girls uh, in science and astronomy in particular. Something that you mentioned, um, you said that uh, it's been changing and I've been seeing, and it's a wonderful change in a positive direction, maybe not fast enough, but at least it's in a positive direction. So I had the honor to interview 
um, Dame Professor Jocelyn Balburnell. And then I recently watched another feature that she did. And it struck me so much when she said that, well, in her case, it was in the 60s and so on, that when she would go to class and it was primarily boys in the class, they would be thumping and catcalling. And I was like, oh my God, you know, that what women have had to go through to just pursue what they love. So let's hope stories like these, stories like yours, um, change the world for the better. All right, so Ariel, what are some of the most, what is one of the most exciting experiences that you've had in whatever you've been engaged um, in? Um, I don't know if uh, jumping out of a plane would count as being exciting, do you think? Jumping out of a plane, did I hear you right? So is that something you would like to do? Is that on your bucket list? It was, it was on my bucket list and then I got to cross it off because I did get to jump out of a plane. Ariel, get out of here. That is remarkable. That is amazing. As a matter of fact, I don't think I know personally anyone else who has jumped out of a plane. And in case our audience does not believe us, so guess what? We're now going to take a look. All right, so folks, for those of you who can believe what you were hearing, now you've actually seen. I mean, I am absolutely in awe that Ariel did skydiving. So tell us, how was the experience like? One of the most incredible experiences ever. And I actually got to do it with one of my best friends as well. So it was like a really nice bonding kind of experience. And um, I just remember when I was signing up to do it, and you had to sign like a waiver and all kind of stuff. It was, it was scary. Right. But then on the day of it, and then when I was on the plane, the only thing I could think about was how excited I was to jump out of this plane. <laughs> because I, you just see like the clouds around you and the sky and like you feel there's a, there's a person on my back and you feel that rocking motion when you're about to jump out of it. And it's so exhilarating. I love and the free fall is just incredible. Oh my God. So can I say out of this world? It is out of this world. Wow. Ariel, I'm in total awe because I mean, you didn't freeze. When you, well, clearly not because we've seen the picture of you um, jumping. That's quite a big thing to knock off on your bucket list at such a young age, I must say. I said I want to do it again and again. <laughs> Just keep sending us pictures and we want a video clip the next time. All right, so one of the things we want to chat with you about and learn about is what is um, the research that you are engaged in that you've completed your MPhil, which is a Master of Philosophy degree in. What is it about? Tell us. So uh, I'm very lucky that I got get to do some, something so interesting. Um, I'm looking at a triple system of black holes. So we consider if you know, if, if you thought a black hole, one black hole wasn't complicated enough, we're like, okay, so what happens if we have three of them all together? And we use programming and we try and look at their orbits and their dynamics and see what actually happens. And now what is really, really fun is that we have all these detectors, these gravitational wave detectors on Earth that detect um, when we have two black holes colliding and merging. And eventually in the future, we want to have one that is way up in space called LISA. So I think that is really cool to, to kind of use the research that I'm doing to kind of, you know, look and see where we might be able to see these supermassive black holes merging and colliding. And um, I don't know, it's really awesome because you would think triple systems of black holes wouldn't actually exist, but they do. And we see them when we have two galaxies merging and we have a two galaxy merging as well. Each of those have within them supermassive black holes. So it's a real thing and it's like very, very cool to be able to, to study it as well. And why is your research important? Yes. Yeah, so we what what it is I do is we use um, these, these programming codes to run simulations and we get like um, a numerical data set of their coordinates and stuff like that. And we can actually plot them and see how they move around each other. And it's, it's, it's really nice. It's really wonderful. And um you know, like I said, we have these detectors that are that that are gonna be up and about working soon and sending back data. So we kind of wanna know beforehand what it is that we're looking for, what it is, what it is these things actually move like in space, so that when we actually try to look for them, we know what we're looking for. So, you know, it's 
That's just fantastic. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that the first picture ever of a black hole um, we were able to see. And it, some people looked at it and said that it's fuzzy. But those of us that understood how difficult it is to even image a black hole, that was just mind blowing. All right. So um, now that you've told us about your research and you seem to say that how the black holes are interacting, um, I'd like for our audience to take a look at some of the work that Ariel has done, a lovely simulation, and it's to music. And when I see it, it reminds me, I would love to call this piece the dance of the black holes. Let's take a look now. Well, that was just amazing. Isn't that something that you can watch over and over and listen to? And that's the beauty of astronomy, of science and mathematics and the wonderful dance the black holes are doing. So Ariel, you are now pretty much at the start of your career. What are your plans moving forward? Yes, I like to, I like to think about myself as being like a baby researcher. And the next step, I'm going to become a toddler researcher. <laughs> so. I really want to I really want to get my PhD. I think that's the next big step. It's a very difficult one, first of all, to, to get into these programs and to actually complete them and, and get your PhD and be able to be called a doctor. That is so awesome. But um, I like to think in, in five year gaps. I think beyond that is too unpredictable. But uh, if I could just continue doing this work and, and continue, you know, keeping my curiosity alive about the sky and astronomy, that is that is the best thing for me. <laughs> All right, that is marvelous to hear. And I agree you're a baby researcher moving to be a toddler researcher. And I really shudder what you call me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So when you're not doing astronomy for research, what do you do for fun? So I think it's very important to have things outside of what you're working on um, to get your mind out of out of that um, I really, well, obviously astronomy, besides research, I also like astronomy, uh, the hobby, um, using my telescope. I do some astrophotography as well, I'm now learning. Um, and I also really love uh, tennis, which I think is, is very important to have like a physical outlet. I started playing tennis when I was like really young. And what I loved about it was, you know, it's one of those sports where you could actually see the physics going on so clearly the way that you hold your racket the amount of velocity that you're driving into the ball as you're hitting it all those things really fascinated me growing up and um i still play it i still love it and yeah <laughs> okay so we can see whatever you do the physics is there always and even as you talk about um playing tennis i'm like okay and now she's looking at the interaction of black holes they all seem to just fall in place wonderfully all right and um you mentioned that you do astrophotography when you're not doing astronomy. Yes, folks, we did that. What does Ariel do for fun? <laughs> astronomy as a hobby. Yeah, how'd you get into it? Yeah, so it's, it's like two different um, baskets, right? One is the, the work aspect, the research, and the other one is the fun part. Um, so I started, I always did astronomy growing up as a teenager. I had a, a small telescope and now I have a bigger one. Um, but the astrophotography, I only really started that um, during COVID, during lockdown. When we, when we had nothing much to do, um, but we had a sky. So that was, you know, a really nice playground at least. So um, I learned a lot about astrophotography and about using my regular DSLR camera to take pictures of really far away things like nebulae and galaxies and stuff like that. And yeah, it's very fun. And we're absolutely, now you're 
I'm sure you're very curious to see what does Ariel's astrophotography look like. And I'm more than delighted to share with you some of the images that she has shared with us. So you can see what you love, you can do it as a hobby and you can make a profession out of it. And for Ariel, it's all been all about astronomy and the universe. So Ariel, on the wormhole, we do these signature questions, right? And now I'm gonna throw them at you. So what gives meaning to your life? Wow, <laughs> you're starting right. <laughs> the first question out of the gates and it's like the biggest one ever. What gives meaning to your life? Um, I think anyone would struggle to answer that question, right? And definitely as the different stages of your life, that answer would change as you get older too. I would say for me, what gives meaning to my life? Like taking a walk in nature, for example. I I realize when I when I take a walk in nature and I and I take a step back from everything that that is clustering our minds now and just look at these simple things like like the leaves on a tree or or I have a lot of dragonflies in my backyard, so I, I, I look at them a lot. Um, but if you look at the wings of a dragonfly and you see just how how complicated that, that structure is and how you can see the mathematics in it as well, it, it is really mind boggling to, to think about that. And then you kind of expand that and you look at anything that is around you, anything in nature, this world, this universe, it's so complex and it's so complicated, yourself included. The, the way that you are, you are made up, it's so complicated, so complex. And I think that is not something that, that we often think about. And um, it kind of ties back into also when I, when I look at the night sky and you look up and you, you kind of see how far, you don't really see how far away everything is, right? You kind of just get this sense, this realization that, whoa, those things are big and they're far away and we are very tiny, we are very small. And, and for a little bit you kind of think you know it doesn't matter but it really it really makes me instead of feel insignificant it makes me feel significant in a way that that we as humans get to exist we are lucky that the atoms formed in this way to allow our short existence and that kind of gives makes me feel meaningful at least that's just amazing and um it's i think it's all about your place in the universe and I can actually really see why you said that you're always drawn to physics and mathematics is sort of seeking the answers for the things that really touched your soul. Ariel, as a teacher of yours, <laughs> I can tell you that you have a scientific soul and I hope you will always burn that torch very, very brightly. All right, mm -hmm. so something much lighter than what gives meaning to your life. Um, what's your favorite movie and or book? I think my favorite, um, my favorite movie, definitely has to be one called Jojo Rabbit. It's it's not a very popular movie, but you know it. No, I, actually, I'm now writing it down on my list of movies to catch up on. I Taika Waititi, and it's it's one of the most amazing movies I've ever seen. I, I saw it in a cinema, and like as the credits rolled, I just sat in the seat and I I just cried because it was so beautiful. Thankfully, the lights were still off, but but it was good. It's actually a dark comedy movie. Uh, for books, I, I really like to read. I think um, one of my favorite authors is Stephen King. But to keep it in the theme, I will tell you one of my favorite books is uh, by, I don't know if you can see it, I have it here, uh, by Chris Hadfield. You know, the guy who, the astronaut. Yeah. Um, an astronaut's guide to life on Earth. What going to space taught me about ingenuity, determination, and being prepared for anything. And I actually read this book while I was at NASA. So it was kind of extra special. Um, it's a really, really great book. Wow. While I have a lot of books in my library, believe it or not, I don't have that one. So right after our show, Amazon, here I come. I'm going to get my copy of that. But that's really wonderful to know. Um, it's amazing how reading really enlightens our souls and movies bring us back down to earth, more or less. <laughs> All right. So um, as we are going to be now wrapping up our segment, um, while you have talked quite a lot about things that um, have amazed you, All right, very briefly, can you tell us a thought, an idea or discovery that blows your mind um one <laughs> one 
I know. So I'm going to say there's so many different things to talk about. Okay. So one that I, I heard about quite recently from a podcast or something that, that the physicist Brian Green was on, he was talking about something called a Boltzmann brain, which just leaves me incredibly mind blown. It's one of the coolest concepts ever. I don't know if I could very briefly say oh, what it is. Please do. Please do. I'm sure you have our audience very curious now. So it's like, um, it's, it's a thought experiment, right? It's not anything concrete or anything like that. But what it says is, you know, space, um, if, you, if you zoom into it, the quantum level, there's a lot of like fluctuations and stuff going on. And, you know, um, matter and antimatter could sp- spontaneously appear and then disappear. And it, it, it kind of says, you know, if we have um, a really long time scale going on, there's a probability that a fully formed human brain could just spontaneously appear and devoid. <laughs> And this human brain, <laughs> this human brain could could have a thought or two, and um, before it disappears again. So, so the the Boltzmann brain is kind of like the question of: Are we right now just a Boltzmann brain? Is this brain like like the patterns of my brain? Is, did it just did that configuration just appear in space randomly, and am I just floating through the void, going to disappear right away? <laughs> so that's kind of what a Boltzmann brain is. It's that is mind blowing. Okay, that definitely deserves the title of mind blowing. Literally, literally, because <laughs> yes, you talk about the brain appearing. Um, so it's fantastic, really, the hypotheses that one can have and ideas and thoughts that uh, thinkers spend their time thinking on and uh, really marveling on our own existence. Okay, so here's the last one. If you could have any animal spirit, what would it be? Um, I would just say a bear, a grizzly bear, because a grizzly bear is, is one of my favorite animals. When I was um when I was younger, I think I, I watched every single documentary about a grizzly bear I could find because I think they are, you know, they're so cute and cuddly and fluffy, but in a second they could become the most ferocious creatures that are just gonna like rip you apart without care you could shoot at those things and nothing they it wouldn't phase them <laughs> they just like they like doing their own stuff and and not having people bothering them i think that's what i like about them a lot <laughs> okay so a grizzly bear for you i must say it would not have been my first guess you know well you like flying out of uh, jumping out of planes i thought maybe ariel might go with an eagle or a bird no it's a grizzly bear <laughs> It's so wonderful to get a little insight into your thoughts. And, um, and I really want to thank you, Ariel, for joining us on this special edition, special episode of The Wormhole, where we are celebrating women and girls in um, astronomy, as well as in science, and of course, the important role of the International Women's Day. And as we can see, you have really shown the um, all that you have achieved at such a young age. And I'm really excited personally to be following your career as you uh, move along. It was such a special honor for me to have my student on and I've been really excited that, hey, through the wormhole, we are both in Trinidad, but I can connect up with Ariel. And I'm like always watching the wormhole. So it's like this, this show, and then I now get to be on it. It's it's a really cool experience. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. So folks, we want to thank all of you for joining us for another episode. And I'm your host, Sharon Hack, signing off from none other than Studio 42, where we seek to find the answers to life, the universe, and everything. Bye.